I'm Warner Cable. Welcome back to the New York Times Close Up. Joining us now, our longtime friend, Harold Holzer. His latest book, number 51, he's either edited, written, or co written A Just and Generous Nation Abraham Lincoln and the Fight for American Opportunity. Just been published by Basic Books. His co author, the economist Norton Garfinkel, reviewed in the Sunday Times Book Review by Columbia University professor Andrew Del Banco. We learn a lot more nuanced personality of the president, his reasons for entering the Civil War rather than a commitment to eradicating slavery or defense of the Union. They argue that Lincoln's guiding principle was a defense of equal economic opportunity. And we look at how this would project today, and the Lincoln that you present in this book looks like Today, he might not even be a Republican. He might even be a supporter of Bernie Sanders. Is that right? You've moved him awfully far left, Sam. But yes, I mean, I think he would be, well, I, I think I'd probably position him more in the Bill Clinton camp mm -hmm. uh, as far as the leanings on economic principle. Uh, he certainly uh, But not even a Republican. I don't think so, not in the current Republican Party. Not a Republican Party that doesn't vote or even allow a discussion of investment in roads, bridges, and infrastructure repair. Uh, not in a government that doesn't believe, a party that doesn't believe in, in underwriting the rail systems of the United States. I think that's where the divergence is. Investment in education and that kind of thing. But is it fair to judge him uh, by 21st century standards when he was a mid 19th century figure? He's a man who also, as you point out, uh, said, I don't believe in a law to prevent a man from getting rich. He also said, uh, the condition of the hired laborer, if he continues through life that way, it's not the fault of the system, but because of either a dependent nature which prefers it or improvidence, folly, or singular misfortune. So are we imposing some 21st century ethos on a 19th century man? Well, you've asked three questions. The last two, I think, are I'm applicable. glad you're keeping track. I'm keeping track. I'm counting on my fingers here. Um, you make points about two of his positions that would, I think would probably be the same today, and that is you lay the groundwork, you create equal opportunity, uh, equal avenue to success, but you depend on motivation, education, drive, ambition, and hard work, which Lincoln believed in very much. Um, on the question of whether it's fair to judge a 19th century man by 21st century standards, of course not, in a way, and yet as someone who reads everything about Abraham Lincoln, I read constant references to the fact that he does not come up to 21st century standards on racial uh, equality. And if we can hang that on him, I think we ought to be able to look and project his economic uh, policies as well. And I think it, it was a consistent belief in equal opportunity, always equal opportunity. And when we talk about equal opportunity, equal chance, how would that have played out in terms of things like gay rights or universal health care or pre-K <laughs> or affirmative action? Yikes. Affirmative action. Well, I think equal opportunity is about as far as we can say Lincoln would have gone. But you have to assume on all of these things that he is going to, the, the man who is Lincoln, the genius who is Lincoln, the advanced man who understands that the promise of the American dream is the crucial thing worth fighting for. Democratic choice, equal responsibility in the world, uh, doing better for yourself, not leaving your fellow man behind, are things that would evolve had he been a 20th century New Dealer, a uh, 21st century Clintonite. I know I'm going out on a, on a limb here, or a, uh, a 1960s great society man. You, you evolve with the times, but you, he wouldn't, I think, and I strongly believe, uh, and my co-author believes, he would not have evolved backwards and believed that the responsibility of government is to just be totally hands-off and to let people sink or swim on their own, mostly, mostly sink, um, in, in times when the government has withdrawn from its basic responsibility of guaranteeing opportunity. So when you apply the Lincoln standards to uh, modern presidents, who is Lincoln-esque? Well, FDR. 
and I think um, we hone in on FDR because A, he revolutionized the country's approach to the economy, nationalized so much, but B, because we're very respectful of and aware of the fact that he tried very hard to get right with Lincoln. He, in fact, is the Democrat who got the African-American vote for the Democratic Party. In 1932, in the midst of the Great Depression, the African-American vote was slightly more Herbert Hoover's than FDR's. Mm. It's hard to believe, with all of the deprivation and all of the, the um, inequality. The, the Southern white vote was so rigidly democratic that African Americans continued to vote the party of Lincoln. It was Roosevelt who invoked Lincoln and Lincoln's promise of opportunity and brought a new um, group together as Democrats that included African Americans. And I think he even hired Robert E. Sherwood, the Pulitzer Prize winning playwright who had written Abe Lincoln in Illinois, mm -hmm. and he hired him as his speechwriter. So beginning in 1940, um, as Roosevelt continues to fight the fight against the Depression, which is still, in a way, existing and, and, and crippling the country, he is now beginning to evoke Lincoln as his model for uh, resisting going backwards and also for getting into the war, which is another issue as well. Harold, uh, we talk about Lincoln not being perfect by any means, even on the issue of race. Uh, we're going through uh, the question of reevaluating, at the very least, uh, Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. Where do we stop when it comes to that, an issue we've been discussing on this program before? How much revisionism do you go through? How much do you stand back and say those people should be judged in the context of their times, or we should now judge them in the context of our times and step back and say, some of these people were just no good mixed. Well, with Wilson, it's clearly a very mixed bag. But if you had ever visited, as I did, um, Woodrow Wilson's childhood home in Columbia, South Carolina, the town where the bullet-riddled, bullet fired by William T. Sherman, bullet-riddled state capital flew the Confederate flag, the Confederate battle flag, as it happened, a symbol of of uh, fighting desegregation, not the Confederacy, you would know that there's a strong bond there. And Wilson was always a problem. I mean, Wilson did all of, undid all of the things that, uh, that Teddy Roosevelt did to integrate the federal bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. How far do we go back? Public monuments uh, to people who were, in essence, traitors have always disturbed me. Reverence for a flag that was not a national flag, but a flag repurposed, a battle flag, repurposed in the 1950s to symbolize mm -hmm. opposition to integration. I think those are the kinds of cows that are not sacred. After Wilson. Harold Holzer, A Just and Generous Nation, Abraham Lincoln and the Fight for American Opportunity, just been published by Basic Books. When